The House Capital Investment Committee will come to order. Members of, in your packets is a memorandum for a letter or a something, a communication from Paul Mandel. Do we have briefs? Um, and I would like you to uh, read that, and we will discuss that at a later time. I don't even know who I am. But it fits in with the uh, field trip that we had on Monday. Uh, the first item on the agenda today is a welcome to Pelican Rapids uh, and Representative Nornis. Please begin. Good morning, Chair Murphy. Pelican Rapids is in Otterfield County and one of our beautiful cities that enjoys a lot of tourism in the summertime. And uh, so I would like to, because of a shortage of time, I won't go any in any detail on the bill, but I have Amy King here from Pelican Rapids who will uh, represent the committee that's been working very hard on this project. Good morning. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to come and present to you this morning. As uh, Representative Norton says, my name is Amy King. I'm here representing the city of Pelican Rapids and the Pelican Rapids Pool Committee. I am here to seek funding to bring a state-of-the-art, family-friendly, friendly, multicultural aquatic facility to Pelican Rapids in the larger regional area. To give you some background, Pelican Rapids is a rural West Central Minnesota community, and we're very unique for our ethnic, cultural, and religious diversity that we have in our community. We have over 14 languages spoken, and over 55% of our population is represented by non-European backgrounds. 22% of our community lives below the poverty line, which is much higher than the national average of 14%. Our pool committee has been working towards this new multicultural aquatic facility that would serve Pelican Rapids in a larger regional area. The facility will promote health and wellness, youth and family, and tourism recreation for our city and the surrounding areas. Our current pool that we have was built in 1978, and it has reached a point of structural deterioration that is no longer reparable. In 2012, we did a study that actually recommended closing the facility, but we've been able to make repairs to keep it open each season since. Um, last summer, to give you a perspective, we had days where it leaked up to 8,000 gallons of water a day. Um, currently, they left about two-thirds of the water in the pool last fall, and it is all drained out. So we're left with a problem this spring of determining how to open it for this season. We're not sure if it actually will. Um, the Pelican Rapids Pool serves as a, a recreational hub of activity in our summer months. If you come see, in 2018 alone, we had 2,500 patrons, which actually equates to the population of our rural community at the pool. Our city campground also sits adjacent and is regularly full, and the pool is one of only two outdoor water facilities in all of Ottertail County, pool, public pool facilities. So there's a wide regional draw that comes to use our facility. Our new facility will be a multicultural facility serving people of all races, ethnicities, and physical modalities. Recreational facilities are proven to promote interaction and exchange and work toward making diverse communities more livable and inclusive for all families. And they allow interaction among our cultural groups to start young as they jump into the pool and grow into adolescence and adulthood. So it's so common at our pool in the summer to see many varying nationalities. It's so fun to see. And we wanna create and continue that safe space for interactions to foster and grow. So Pelican Rapids is so eager to continue building an inclusive, welcoming community. And this pool is a safe opportunity for us to do that. I am really proud to say we've already raised $1.73 million of our $3.7 million budget. And we have another 500,000 pledged in matching funds that we're working towards. The 1.8 million that we are seeking here from the state bonding funds would allow this pool to be constructed as early as 2021, which is our goal. Facilities such as this multicultural aquatic facility have the potential to help cities like Pelican Rapids thrive and help in that rural rejuvenation process. You as our elected officials have the opportunity to help fund a portion of this project mm -hmm. and have a significant and direct impact on our youth and families, health and wellness, and regional tourism and recreation. So I would ask, do you have any questions I can answer and will you partner with us to make this facility possible? Any questions that I can answer for the committee? Thank you, Ms. King. Yes. Representative Constantine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say to Representative Nordness, I appreciate the honest, hardworking advocacy you do for your community. I have no 
comment. M Ms. King. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. King um, yes. Do you charge fees at this pool? We do. It's a very nominal fee. We did regional research. Um, currently, our, our fees are $3 a day for kids to come enjoy. We also have a, a pass that can get you a, a membership, and it's, I want to say, $50 to $60. Um, they're way below all of the other regional area pools, and we do that on purpose, given that we have such diversity in our community, so that it is accessible to anyone. Are the fees... Um did the fees pay for the previous the operating expenses and operating and expenses and uh, fixing up the pool yes. year by year kind of stuff? They have it. not. Um, fees brought into into the pool have paid for a portion of those um, constru reconstruction that is needed, but the city has had to put some dollars in. To give you an example, the current operating budget is approximately fifty thousand dollars of our current pool, um, and revenue sat about twenty eight thousand. So the city understands that there is a commitment to further funding that. Um, as with any aquatic facility, as you look at different operating budgets. Um, and all of this has run through our city council. They've actually committed over a million dollars to the project um, from the city as well and are, are very excited to move this forward for our community. Thank so. you very much. Representative Norris, Norris renews his motion for House File 2933 to be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank all you in for favor, your time. signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much, Ms. King. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative yeah. Nornas. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Representative yeah, Draskowski, I will move that House File 3017 be considered for possible inclusion. Please begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'd like to thank you and uh, Ms. Nash for your help in, uh, in offering to uh, have this hearing today. With me is Brad Drankon, who is a mayor of Zombroda. Uh, Zombroda has a, a road that used to be a state road that was turned back and it was not brought up to city standards. So, Ma Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to Chair Drankon. Madam Chair, members, thank you so much for your time this morning. Zombroda's busiest and most important city street is Jefferson Drive. It, was built in 1934 as an original section of US 52. When the highway was expanded in 64, 52 was made into four lanes and moved about a quarter of a mile to the west where it sits today. This section of old 52 or Jefferson Drive, if it's about two miles, is the project that we're here to talk to you about. Our estimates by our engineers for rebuilding this road are $6 million. It's far beyond the city's capability financially to tackle. So we're here today to ask for help. We're looking at a 50-50 cost share, three million from the state, three million from the city, which we would most likely have to bond for. As you know, cities our size, under 5,000 people, aren't eligible for federal infrastructure money. Uh, you might ask if this project is fair. In other instances where roads have been turned back, the state has either given them to an entity that can afford to pay for them like a county, or they've rebuilt them and given them to cities to take care of. Neither of those happened. You might ask if this project is regional. Our fire department, our ambulance, our branch of the Mayo Clinic, and the main route to Zimbabwe Mazeppa Public Schools are all accessed by Jefferson Drive. Every fire truck that answers a call in Zimbabwe or the neighboring town and townships, every ambulance that answers a call in the area of Goodyear, <coughs> Belchester, Mazeppa, Pine Island, Wanamingo, or Zimbabwe, every school bus that takes a kid to school in the morning to Zimbabwe Mazeppa Public Schools and takes a moment at night drives on Jefferson Drive. You might ask if this project is needed. Well, in your packets, there's a very short presentation, including drone footage of this road for you to take a look at and to see that uh, despite the best efforts of the city to maintain this road, it's in need of rebuilding. And you might ask if this project has support. We're grateful to have the unanimous support of the Goodyear County Commissioners, the support of our state legislators, Mike, Senator Mike Goggin and Representative Jaskowski, who we thank for giving us the opportunity to be here today. But we also are grateful for you and your commitment to Minnesota's small towns because without your help, 
projects this size are over overwhelming to towns of our size. So thank you, and I will answer any questions you might have. Representative Erdoff. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I'm sure this is a very valuable uh, project. You know, we certainly need to take a, a, a good look at uh, you know areas that. You have difficulty in paying for projects. That's the, the purpose of of this committee, and you know, particularly, uh, you know, looking at a, a Drazkowski bonding project. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, we kind of keep a total, uh, and we're wondering, uh, Representative Drazkowski, do you have a lot more bonding projects coming forward that we need to anticipate? <clears throat> Representative Drzowski. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Erdahl. Uh, this is my only one this year, uh, Representative Erdahl. Um, thank you. All right, well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, and Representative Drzowski. Well, you know, we'll, we'll certainly give this uh, due consideration, uh, and uh, I just hope this isn't the start of a trend for you. <laughs> I'd only bring the best projects, Representative Erdahl, and this one is in great need. Should be noted that Representative Erdahl is the lead minority member on this committee, and he is razzing <laughs> his favorite representative <laughs> from some Broda. <laughs> thank you very much. Any other questions? If not, we will, and I thank you for recognizing that we do care about the small towns in Minnesota. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. on the agenda is uh, House File 2838, Grassy Point, Representative Olson, and your, rep and your presenters uh, is Frank Letterly, um, who is the Rail and Freight Planning Director for MINDA. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members, um, I, uh, my name is Frank Letterly. I am the um, uh, supervisor of the rail and freight planning section of the Office of Freight and Commercial Vehicle Operations for for, Minute, for MnDOT, and we are presenting today on the Grassy Point Bridge. The uh, the Grassy Point Bridge is a 1,645 foot railroad bridge that crosses St. Louis Bay between Superior, Wisconsin, and Duluth, Minnesota. The bridge was built in 1912. The middle span of the bridge opens to allow ships to pass through the harbor to the south. And this is the only freight rail connection between Minnesota and Wisconsin in the vicinity of the harbor. Uh, the bridge is an important freight facility with frequent use by freight trains crossing between Minnesota and Wisconsin and is used by every major railroad in the region including the BNSF, Canadian National and Union Pacific. At over 100 years old, <clears throat> the bridge requires a combination a restorative and preventive maintenance that would bring the bridge back to a state of good repair. Increasing operating speeds on the bridge and ensuring reliable operation would be an overall benefit to freight operations in the Twin Ports. The, uh, the bridge is not just a static structure, it's in fact a large machine. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, the opening of the center span is powered by electrical motors that first lift the center span off its supports and then rotate the span 90 degrees to create openings for large ships. Uh, the rehab work would consist of updating the electrical and mechanical devices that lift the span off its supports before opening, updating the center pivot, bearing, and gearing that allow the bridge span to rotate, and updating the various devices that ensure that the bridge comes to rest in the proper position when closing. 
The operators' houses and equipment houses that house the controls and machinery would also be renovated or replaced. Uh, these upgrades would be entirely within the mechanical portions of the bridge. There would be no impact on the steel truss bridge itself. Last August, key components of, this, of the mechanical systems that allow the center span to rotate failed. The bridge was stuck open for almost three weeks, uh, requiring freight trains that normally would cross St. Louis Bay to be diverted to other routes. The congestion and delays that resulted from this diversion had a significant deleterious effect on the proper, function, proper functioning of the freight railroad network in the Duluth Superior area. Major components of the bridge operating mechanism needed to be manufactured because there are no readily available replacement parts for a 100-year-old bridge. The failure of one key component last August installed over 100 years ago foreshadows further failures that are likely to occur in the near term. The condition of the Grassy Point Bridge was studied as part of the Northern Lights Express Preliminary Engineering Environmental Review and Service Development Plan because Northern Lights Express passenger train service would cross St. Louis Bay between Minnesota and Wisconsin over the Grassy Point Bridge. The reason I bring this up is because the improvements associated with this funding request have already been subjected to environmental review with the Federal Railroad Administration issuing a finding of no significant impact uh, in February of 2018, meaning that we can move forward with this project uh, immediately because we don't have to go through the environmental review process. But while the re rehabilitation of the bridge would support the reliable operation of passenger rail service and was considered a, an important element of the NLX project, it has become evident that rehabilitating the bridge is critical to increase the efficiency and safety of the bridge and ensure the continuing functioning of the freight railroad system in the region. Thank you. Rep. Sam Olson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm sorry I missed the motions on the bill. We have an oral amendment that we need to make to the bill to get it in the order we need. I move that uh, House File 2888 uh, is before the committee and that we would like an oral amendment. Would you like to state it? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So in one line 1.6 and 1.12, the appropriation should actually be $8.75 million. Eight point eight point seven five million. That's a better number That's, than we I have. I assume you like amendments like that in this committee. <laughs> we we approve of those. It's House File two eight three eight. I move the oral amendment. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted for two point or for eight point seven five million dollars. Change. Okay. Um, Mr. Jones, do you have a statement to make on behalf of the Amtrak? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, just that uh, I'm here uh, just to reconfirm that Amtrak. Uh, very much supports uh, the uh, NLX project uh, in its entirety uh, and that we are willing to uh, commit dollars to implementing this project uh, should the state decide to uh, advance projects like this uh, to uh, bring about an NLX. Thank you very much. Representative Constantine. Just move the bill as amended. Okay. Uh -huh. it, the bill will be held over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, Representative Salk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do I understand correctly? I thought I, in following your descriptions, the repairs are gonna be done on the swing elements and the ability of the bridge to swing as opposed to any structural weight bearing or load bearing portions. Uh, that, that's Mr. correct. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, the, um, yes, that is correct. The, the actual bridge, as you, as you see it, would not change. It would be kind of the, the, the inside mechanical mm -hmm. portions of the bridge. And Mr. Letterly, you mentioned um, how that will, you said raise the efficiency, but um, now it's my understanding that the train can only go uh, five miles or less an hour. 
And uh, so uh, what would that do to a train speed um, in the future? Uh, a portion of the mechanical systems is the is the way in which the bridge closes and can reconnects back to the rails in either direction. And so what, uh, some of the components that are involved would, would uh, ensure that the, those connections are much more precise and would therefore allow trains to operate through the bridge at a higher speed. But not a particular amount? Uh, we, we think we would get it up to 30 miles per hour. Thank you very much. If not, the bill will be held over as amended <coughs> with, for the possible inclusion. Thank you very much. House file 2888. Oh. Representative Gunther, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my privilege to uh, be here again. And it's our privilege to have you here. Damn right. Please begin. Okay. Uh, 20 years ago, Representative Henry Callis and I introduced a bill for the Lake Crystal Rec Center. They raised a lot of money themselves. I remember attending many ice cream socials and everything else. And uh, to uh, introduce the bill and tell you what they really want, Ryan Yonkers, or Yonkers, is here from Lake Crystal and he can tell you what they need. Dr. Yonkers, welcome. Thank you, Honorable Chair, members of the committee. I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I've served as the executive director of the Lake Crystal Area Rec Center for the past eight years. 25 years ago, this group of people came together with a plan to create a community and recreation center to serve South Central Minnesota to be located in the city of Lake Crystal. Between individual and business donors, um, as was said, many millions of dollars was raised, were raised and the state saw fit to contribute $1.5 million to complete the funding to make sure this project happened. Together, we built a facility with an amazing swimming pool where we hold uh, swimming lessons for toddlers to adults, water aerobics for seniors, many family-friendly events, our gym, uh, walking track, fitness center are accessible 24-7 to members, and our multi-purpose gym holds uh, events year-round which attract people from Fairmont to St. Peter, from New Ulm to Owatonna. Staying true to our mission to serve all, we offer membership scholarships so that anyone may access the rec center regardless of ability to pay. From our fully accessible pool, to wheelchair basketball, to free lunch and learn events for seniors, to free family events, we balance our fiscal responsibilities with our mission to serve. Finally, we partner with all three of our local healthcare providers uh, to provide wellness and nutrition education, to provide on-site physical therapy, we partner with our community, uh, community education and local schools to share gym space, to share programming, and we aggressively pursue grants which have made a significant financial impact. The city, the city of Lake Crystal contributes over $200,000 a year annually to operations and Blue Earth County contributes another $30,000. We have successfully operated and maintained this facility for 20 years, but now there are a number of large, expensive capital projects which just much must be addressed. Uh, the E are mainly the main HVAC unit for the pool, which is inefficient, been repaired repeatedly, uses a now obsolete kind of coolant. Uh, our uh, roof project, which has been also patched repeatedly after 20 years, is shrinking and cracking, and our pool deck needs to be resurfaced. Our request is for $375,000. We estimate the whole project to cost about $550,000. The city has already committed $200,000 towards this project, so we do have um, uh, local funds. But uh, the cost of these improvements represents a heavy financial burden all at once to the city of Lake Crystal. I would argue that the state made a wise investment into a regional resource 20 years ago that has paid back in measurable and immeasurable dividends of health and wellness and quality of life. Although this is one of the smallest asks you will hear before you, I will tell you that I think it will make one of the greatest impacts and it does for the people of this region. 
and I ask for your support. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, as someone who might have a, a similar project uh, to this, I'm, I'm curious as to uh, what, when you built this in, in 2000 and the state uh, contributed 1.5 million, uh, what, what was the total cost then? So, Madam Chair? Um, Mr. Youngers. It was uh, approximately $5 million. So nowadays, probably 20, 25 million. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, you know, I'd like to uh, you know, commend Representative Gunther for uh, you know, his uh, early commitment to this project uh, and for uh, continuing to represent Lake Crystal so well. Thank you. Even though it's not in my district? Oh, oh, really? Uh, who? <laughs> represents Sandstead. Madam, Madam Chair, who, who represents Lake Crystal? I think Chair. Representative Munson does. Oh. Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Did you say the city was contributing $200,000 to the project? The, Madam Chair? Mm, Dr. Uh, Yonkers. Correct. Uh, they have allocated up to $200,000. Thank you. Anything else? Representative Constantine. Thank you. I'll make it very quick. I have also attended multicultural events in this facility um, in the past to play Santa Claus for an Asian American kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret. I don't think they're here. Madam Chair? Dr. Yonkers. Um, I will say, especially since that group came earlier with a, with a similar proposal, that we have been approached by uh, Fairmont, Byron, uh, a number of other communities have visited us many times to ask us how we did this, how we operate it, and as a model for other cities to do the same. That with a little help from the state up front and then the, the uh, local area is able to sustain it. Um, it, it has served as a model for other places. Uh, Representative Gunther, um, would you object if, um, while, when we're considering this, if we change the line uh, 1.11 on your bill because of the $200,000 uh, oh. offer that we've received? Is that, I, I don't have a copy of the bill here. It says that it does not require a non-state match. And you yes, uh, I would not object to that. I know they have anticipated contributing to the project, and uh, they have not asked for the full amount. They've asked for 375000 yeah, yeah. yes. All right. With, with that, Representative Constantine. Do we need an oral amendment? No, we don't. Not at this time, because we're going to hold it over for possible inclusion. Which leads me up to, since you're mostly all here at this particular moment, in your minds, next week we're, we're going to start the process of, rather than expanding the number of projects under consideration, we are going to start thinking about and talking about discussing, condensing the number of projects. And that's going to be build, build, we're going to build on that in the days to come. And so you should be in your own minds and making lists of various categories of for sure, not so much. And the process that we used last year to a point. And so start thinking about that. I'm giving you a fair warning so you won't be shocked. <laughs> but we cannot continue uh, adding more and more things to the agenda. We're going to have to start narrowing it down. And isn't it wonderful that you were here for Lake Crystal today 
because we didn't start narrowing down yet. Thank, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. <laughs> I appreciate your consideration of this project. Thank you for coming, Dr. Junkers. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> The next bill that we are going to consider is House File 2989, Representative Sundin and Sheriff Kelly Lake. Welcome to the committee. Representative Sundin, we are going to hear your your discussion about what the bill is, and we're going to hold it over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 2989 is going to bring parity to the services that uh, uh, Carleton County can uh, provide for female incarcerated personnel, and uh, it meshes well with some other plans that the county has. Uh, and I hope uh, we get into a few of the details there and convince this committee about the value of uh, what can be done uh, in Carleton County. Ms. Lake. Madam Chair, thank Chair you Lake. and good morning uh, members of the committee. Madam Chair, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, so our uh, seeking funding for this is for a regional female offender program as uh, part of a component of our Carleton County Jail. So as sheriff, public safety is obviously paramount to, to what I do. It's my top priority. And part of, a large part of that is our jail facility um, and the programming components within it. Because ultimately we want our offenders who come into our jail, uh, we know they're going to be returning to our communities and we want them to return uh, better than when they came out and we don't want them coming back. Um, so part of the, the regional female offender program uh, came about uh, because we've been studying um, uh, our jail for about the past five years. Our jail is 40 years old, over 40 years old right now, and we knew that it is ending its near uh, end of life. And we actually just uh, recently received a sunset letter from the Minnesota Department of Corrections that after July 31st, 2023, we can no longer use our current jail facility. So we've been planning for that. Part of that uh, came in the fact that the female offender population has grown exponentially uh, in, in our county and region-wide after we've been looking at. In fact, over the last 12 years, our female offender population has doubled. Um, there is a Minnesota state statute that requires parity in male and female uh, offender programming. That does not currently exist in, in our county or region-wide, in fact, statewide. So there are, are many programs for male offenders, but uh, we know that for female offenders, there's some specific programming uh, for, for that gender um, that uh, should, be, should be met, and it isn't. So that is a gap that we want to be able to provide in our facility. Um, we have... Uh, Currently, Carleton County is part of a five county area um, community corrections, um, and that is the Arrowhead Regional Corrections. And we do have a female offender program that is available to us, but that is only 10 beds, and that is more of a step-down program. It is not a secure facility like a jail would be. Um, it, we would work in conjunction with that program. It is, is a step in what we would be able to provide. Uh, so, in our female offender program, we would look at some big picture um, areas. Uh, the ask for this is for planning and design for this program. Uh, but we know that uh, there are some female specific needs in program creation, uh, such as trauma-based interventions, domestic violence, uh, mental health, chemical dependency, all very important areas we want to focus on, physical health, life skills, um, education, including including parenting education. Um, what we want to focus on is, is a continuum of care. We want to look at uh, the female offenders from the time that they come in our door, the time that they're arrested, through incarceration, and actually um, making that connection out in, to our community and, and connecting them with community services once they are released as well. Um, we have gotten uh, a lot of support for this concept, for this program, um, to include our Arrowhead Regional Corrections Executive Director 
and the board. Um, we have uh, also been in talks with our um, Fond du Lac band and tribal chair. Um, he is also very supportive of this concept. Um, our, our current jail uh, makeup of our inmates is approximately 30% Native American. Um, so that is a, another very uh, important component that we want to consider and that we do consider in planning for this and designing this. Um, we also have, uh, I have spoken with Department of Corrections Commissioner Chanel, who is here with us today, uh, in support of this program concept uh, because uh, there has been uh, obviously recognized gap uh, and a need for this service for the female offender program. We also have uh, support of our sixth judicial district chief judge and also St. Louis County, who is uh, the largest county in our Arrowhead Regional Corrections, again, has noticed the, uh, and recognized the gap and the need for this female offender program. So we are really hoping uh, that this funding would allow us to be able to do some comprehensive planning and design work around this so that we can provide that uh, programming uh, which is much needed for these offenders. Thank you very much, Representative Dean. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, th this sounds like a, a really, really important project for the region. And I'm curious, has you guys know how many beds you're looking at trying to design for? Is that part of the pre-design process or are you sort of on track. Obviously, the facility you have currently is inadequate, and you're trying to uh, make do through other facilities. But if you could just talk a little bit about what that is, and one other additional question: Can you talk about the sort of the makeup of what type of offenses generally of the women that would be, you know, uh, using the facilities? Chair Flake, Madam Chair, thank you. Yes, so we, in, in our design, all the planning that we've been doing the last five years, um, we have identified uh, an approximately 84 bed facility for our current jail that we would need. And within that, we were looking at um, a 24 to 30 bed um, female specific um, program regionally. Again, part of our design mm -hmm. would be to, to really uh, get down in the details of exactly what that would look like, um, how many, and what uh, programming would be within that. Uh, but that's, that's the thoughts on that. In, in our conversations with St. Louis County, again, who is our, our lar largest county in our uh, community corrections area, um, they indicated at any given time they have approximately nine females that are sentenced in their current facility. However, um, having said that, the chief judge uh, in the 6th District also indicated that there could be more than that that would be sentenced to a facility if there was programming available specific. There is not that option. There's, there's local jail with not a lot of programming uh, contained with it or prison. There is not a lot of options in between for females offender, offenders in, in around the state. Certainly not in, in the whole northern half of Minnesota. So that is an area that we're trying to, a, a gap that we've identified that really we believe needs to be captured and what we're looking at. So again, this money would help us design, um, you know, more the specific needs around that. Representative uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and just that follow up, what is the type of offenses generally that uh, these women find themselves with? Sheriff Lake. Madam Chair, thank you. So in our uh, comprehensive look at our local um, population of female offenders, um, which we believe is going to be pretty consistent throughout the region, um, we had pretty much top five offenses of why we see females. A lot of it is going to be drug related. Um, probation violations. So they've been sentenced already. Um, they're out in the community and they do not abide by their conditions of release. So then they're brought in and arrested on a probation violation uh, pursuant to that. Um, theft is another one and domestic violence uh, is another one. Um, and then just uh, some traffic, uh, uh, DWI traffic related things like that. But uh, those are gonna be the top ones, probation violation, um, drugs, theft. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Representative Lehman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm really interested in this project because I'm working very closely with Itasca County on construction of a new co correctional facility or, mm -hmm. or jail. Uh, we don't know exactly the size of that project yet, but um, uh, my question is twofold. You talked about St. Louis County. Is is there any? Have you are, have you working at all with Itasca County? Is I mean, how big is this region? So right now we have been focusing on just our ARC, our Arrowhead Regional Corrections, five county area. Mm -hmm. But certainly, if we had you know beds available in in the space that we have, uh, once that's identified, if there was room for that, um, we would be certainly open to you know other areas. Uh, we have discussed that absolutely. And a second part, a second, maybe different question is: um, You're looking for bonding money. There's no match. Um, for the design portion of this. I don't know if you can think this far ahead, but I'm sure you have. Um, where would you, would you be coming back for bonding money to actually build the facility? And w if so, where would you get the match? How, how do you see this coming together? Sheriff Lake. Madam mm -hmm. Chair, thank you. So we have actually, um, we're designing an, an entire jail. This female offender program would be a component of that jail. And we have actually gone, um, also we're requesting um, to be able to put a local option sales tax on a referendum to be able to pay, for, or have the voters have a choice on how they want to pay for the facility. Um, so that right now would be the plan for the, the overall facility. It just follow up to that representative layman so the idea would be carlton county would bond for the project and then pay for the the debt out of a local sales tax option <laughs> okay is that correct that's correct okay okay thank Re you representative sundin is that in the is did carlton county apply before january 31st that for bill that is sales in the work that, that bill is in the works thank you commissioner You have a brief comment to make, and I understand it has something to do with your comment that you made before when we were talking about when one state agency regulates a county or what happens. Welcome back to the committee, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, I, I'm here today simply to, to uh, talk about the fact that uh, this project came in after the governor's review uh, and therefore it's not in the governor's package. However, it falls within the framework of, of, of some of the administration priorities of trying to address issues of women, uh, children and families. Uh, we think that there are some uh, unique opportunities here. There is nothing in the state like this. And I think there is an opportunity for regionalization and looking at uh, possibilities of, of how a facility like this can actually uh, be part of the continuum of how we manage uh, uh, folks who are coming into the system. Um, and uh, we think there's some real opportunity here. So I just wanted to give voice to that. And I'm uh, grateful for the county and we would pledge to work with them uh, and their partners on, on uh, determining and working through the scope of the project. Very good. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge that Commissioner Brenner is here too, and um, I know he's been on the A on the Arrowhead Regional Corrections uh, Advisory Committee or the the board that makes the decisions for the regional corrections, and uh, I'm sure he was interested in uh, what might be an expansion of. Uh, the corrections okay. at some point in time. But I certainly wouldn't address that today on a bonding project. 40 years of relationship. Thank Welcome, you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this has been, oh, and on my, on my mind for a long, long time, uh, uh, a facility up here for, for females. We've been very, very lacking. And uh, ARC actually, at one time, which I'm sure Mary's been well aware of, that we have also talked about this type of programming, uh, and we will probably since the night partner with uh, ARC Area Regional Corrections for the actual programming that would be in the jail uh, uh, for female offenders. 
Representative Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair and Sheriff. So one thing that struck me from your testimony is that you said that 30% of your population is Native American. Can you give me uh, an idea of for the ARC, what is the population of the Native Americans for that area? Uh, for, for the entire region, the not the jail incarcerated the, population, but the general population. Madam Chair, the general population. I would not be able to give you specifics, and I would hate to guess on that. But it would be it's five counties. Okay. I believe in Carlton County, it's four to five percent. But I would have to get that information specifically for you, and certainly could do that. So, Madam Chair, uh, I'm asking this because I, it seems like you know, for a population of four or five percent, when we have 30 percent that are Native American, that's concerning for me. And I would like to ask you, what are some specific programmings to address some of the root causes that uh, you know were identified in Representative Dean's questions that you're talking about the the folks who are coming into your care, and what will this you know with this funding particularly do to help address some of those uh, root causes? Of Sheriff Lake. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, that is a very good question. And we have a very good working relationship with our, uh, the Fond du Lac tribe. Um, in fact, we have um, reentry programs currently that are in existence that we work very closely with their public health and human services division, their law enforcement division, in looking at what we can do to serve the Native American population in our facility. Uh, they actually come into our jail and, and provide some of our program al programming already currently, and we hope to expand upon that. In fact, um, in speaking with uh, Chairman Dupi, um, we have discussed uh, looking at, through this design process of, of our facility, ha having space incorporating uh, Fond du Lac staff right within our facility um, so that we're you know making sure that we are providing culturally um, appropriate programming and what is you know directed to the needs of the native american population not only while they're there but also again that continuity of care that continuum of care out into the community is very important to us thank you very much we will hold this bill um house file 2989 over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair, and a special thanks to the tes uh, testifiers and the uh, team that came down from Carleton County. Yes. Uh, it's a group effort. Thank you. And it's only because you traveled so far that we allowed more than one speaker. We can drive around the block to get more time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam thanks Chair. Thanks so much Members for coming. Thank you. I was at the grand opening of the new jail 40 years ago, or 42 years ago, because that was my district at the time. So I suspect I'll be at the next grand opening, too, if indeed it is included. Um, house file 2970. Representative Richardson, Commissioner Atkins, I observed earlier, Representative, former Representative Atkins, that you use this as a social hour <laughs> and meeting old friends or former friends or reacquainting yourself. It's nice to be home, Madam Chair. Thank you for coming. And uh, I just have Joe Atkins' name on my agenda. And Commissioner, or who else does I have? Representative Richardson, who else? Madam Chair, we have the mayor of Invergrove Heights, uh, George Torville, joining us today as well. Okay. Welcome. Please Great. proceed. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. House File 2970 is seeking $5 million for the Veterans Memorial Greenway Project in Dakota County. Dakota County is home to more than, than 23,000 veterans, and this project would create a five-mile paved route that would be the lo longest greenway in Minnesota dedicated to honor the service of our veterans. In addition to the memorial for our vets, parents, students, teachers, and administrators in the districts are also champions of this project because it will also serve to increase safety in our community. Currently, there's not a safe and accessible route to connect pop popular parks and natural areas across uh, busy Highway 52 and also Pine Bend Elementary School. Uh, today, I have former state rep and uh, Dakota County Commissioner Joe Atkins to speak briefly about the project. Commissioner Atkins. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, members. It's nice to see some old friends. Um, it's even better to see uh, some staff folks that I had an opportunity to, to work with and uh, specifically to wish uh, Ms. Nash her 30th anniversary here. Congratulations and thank you for your service. Um, a year ago, you may remember, um, we testified about pedestrian safety uh, here in the committee and I appreciate that opportunity. We had just suffered a fatality on a county road um, just prior to that. Since that time, we've suffered another. A uh, 13 year old boy crossing a county road uh, on November 1st um, lost his life. And so, when we, I, I somewhat take offense when people refer to this simply as a bike trail. Uh, this is a focus of Dakota County. We've seen a 35% increase in, in fatalities, not just here, but across the country. And so, we're laser focused on trying to, to improve pedestrian safety. I appreciate the bonding committee coming out and taking a look at our projects. Uh, this one, it literally is the crow flies. You're one mile between an elementary school and our most popular park and a new nature center. Can you get there safely? Not at all. Um, you'd have to cross over busy Highway 52 to get, uh, uh, to get from our most popular um, Mississippi River Greenway that you helped uh, with 200,000 users a year to our most popular park at Lebanon Hills, 900,000 users a year. Uh, you have to cross two train tracks, two highways, and two, two state highways and two county highways. 54,000 trips at grade in conflict with cars, trucks, trains. You're putting bicyclists, bicyclists and pedestrians uh, in direct conflict with train traffic, truck traffic, and vehicle traffic. Uh, this is about pedestrian safety. Uh, we also, uh, and I'm gonna have Mayor Turville speak to the veterans piece. We are the, and this surprises people, uh, we're the second, uh, 23,000 veterans in Dakota County. We're the home to the second most number of veterans anywhere in Minnesota. And we have no veterans memorial uh, honors for, uh, for our veterans. This would also suffice in, in addressing that. Uh, so for pedestrian safety for veterans, um, we'd appreciate your support for this important project. Uh, the match is more than half. We've already made an investment of our own uh, and we're seeking funding for the other half as well. With that, I'll turn it to Mayor Turville. Good morning and thank you for um, hearing us. I'm here on behalf of the city of Invergrove Heights and a large portion of this uh, east-west corridor is in the city of Invergrove. It also, in taking a look at Joe a County Park that is farther to the west, it also will um, entail Rich Valley Park in the city of Invergrove Heights, which is home to uh, soccer, lacrosse, uh, softball, and uh, baseball. And uh, we're taking a look at the, the, the major component of this is safety. And when the idea came up that we could uh, name it um, a, a, in honor of veterans and being a veteran myself, I thought, what a great idea, <laughs> right? And, and so we are, um, we're taking a look, our full support for the city working with the county, and hopefully we can get some additional support and uh, make this happen. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we'll continue or answer questions that uh, may be as we go along the process, but uh, we consider it a major, um, again, number one is safety to this for pedestrians and uh, for uh, bicyclists, and also in taking a look at uh, connectivity um, for now and for the future. Represent Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's customary to attain or to refer to someone by the highest office that they have attained. And so if it's all the same to you, I'll refer to you as Commissioner Atkins. I'd go with representative as long as we're sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not specific to this project, but uh, this is your opportunity to, to talk to the Capital Investment Committee. 
Could you give us your thoughts on bonding in general as it relates to Dakota County and Dakota County's role um, with the entire population of the state and, and the projects that you have in, in your area? Uh, Representative Jurgens, Madam Chair, and members, uh, Dakota County represents 8% of the state's population, more than 8% of the state's revenues. Our requests, bonding-wise, are considerably less than that. Um, the, uh, the total Dakota County ask is about $30 million uh, with all of our requests that have been submitted thus far, uh, even together with all of our local communities, still well beneath. If you have a, a $1.5 billion bonding bill, for example, 8% of that would be $120 million. We're not even approaching that, Madam Chair. So we're trying to be as frugal as we can, but would appreciate your support. We're on House File 2970. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This bill will be held over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you. Representative Detmer, it's your turn. Three words. Three little words. House file 3189, Representative Detmer, you have a short short, and short and sweet, Madam Chair. And again, uh, yeah, you're right, just three words. Uh, we're actually amending. Um, Laws uh, 2017, first special session, chapter eight, article one, section 15, subdivision three. And uh, again, uh, if most of you have traveled from the Twin Cities up to our great North Country, you've passed Forest Lake. And uh, it's a great place to stop on your way north. And, um, but the interstate uh, highway that come, going right past Forest Lake, we put in a new bridge in, in, on 97 and the interstate. And uh, I, I, today I'd like to, uh, you know, introduce uh, Mayor Priner is here. Jesse Priner is here from Columbus, the city of Columbus, and the county engineer Joe uh, McPherson. I'd like to have him just share some, maybe some history of this uh, project and how it's going. It's almost finished up. They have some work to do on the lights and the, and also uh, some other road work there. But uh, this project, uh, we started on working on this in 2015 and it passed in 2017. So we'd like to turn it over to uh, County Engineer. Thank you, Representative, and thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm happy to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to present this information to you today and just give you a summary of where we're at. So as Representative Detmer had mentioned, this is a project that actually goes back about a decade here. Uh, the partnership between the city, the county, and the state to get this project to unfold. It's your as he mentioned, it's the first interchange north of where 35E and 35W come together. So it's that first interchange. If you've been through there recently, the diverging diamond interchange, which is one of very few in the state, is almost fully constructed. We're almost there, so we're excited about that. What I wanted to do today is just kind of explain uh, the background of where that $9 million came from, where that figure was, how we got there. As the representative mentioned, this was a process that started in 2015. And in 2017, we were successful at obtaining $9 million in LRIP funds to make the necessary local roadway improvements. And what that is, is when we started in 2015, we had a request amount of almost $25 million. But in the span of those two to three years, we trimmed the fat. We looked at what is the, what is the necessary improvements that we need to do to make sure that when MnDOT comes through and they construct the new interchange and do the 35 um, overlay, that we have our roadways in the correct position and construction to get that project done. So we looked at that. We narrowed it down to the CASA 54, which is West Freeway Drive, CASA 23, which is Lake Drive. Those are on the west side of the interchange. And then Hornsby Street, we realigned that to match up with the south section, which is south of Trunk Highway 97. So the, the $9 million funds was to construct those three sections. Those were um, a high priority to get that other interchange done. So during the project, as it unfolded through between 2017 and today, we experienced some efficiencies with delivering those projects. Uh, the County Road 54 and 23 projects came in under bid. 
And in addition, when we completed the plans for the County Road 54 project, we were actually able to mitigate some of the proposed wetland impacts. We cut our wetland impacts in half. And then we also uh, tweaked the alignment a little bit to help minimize and mitigate some of the business impacts that would have unfolded with the original design. So that was a benefit. Uh, we also leveraged local dollars to help pay for part of that interchange. Uh, the county put forward $4.2 million to help pay for the diverging diamond interchange over 35 on 97. So throughout the project, there's been a leverage of local funds. So based on the savings that we received from good bids during the 2017, 2018 construction seasons and some other efficiencies that were experienced in the design of the projects, we also, there's gonna be a, a remaining balance of those $9 million in LRAP funds of approximately 1.2 to $1.4 million. And so this request before you today is there's one section of that intersection that wasn't um, constructed through this original bill. And what that is is we saw that as it wasn't the extreme high priority that we needed to get the interchange done, but it's still an important leg to that interchange that we need to get it done and tie it into the County Road 2354 intersection. But we needed that $9 million to get everything out of the way and prep for the 97 interchange. So I open it up to any questions you may have. That's a lot of information. So what are you asking for, Ms. McPherson? Sure. So what we're asking for is that remaining balance, as I mentioned, about 1.2 to $1.4 million that remains from that original bill, that $9 million, we'd like to use that funds to help leverage that to complete that last leg, the West Freeway Drive which is on, on the west side of the interchange north of County Road 23 or Lake Drive. You're asking for the 1.2 to 1.4 million dollars that the state should be receiving back for this west drive thing. That's correct, Madam Chair. So that 1.2 million dollars, uh, when we originally did the the final ask for $9 million, we focused on the highest priority to get that interchange done. And that was County Road 54, County Road 23, and the Hornsby Street realignment. And so we still had a high, a high need for that West Freeway Drive, which is that local section of West Freeway Drive. However, we focused on what the main priority was to deliver that 97 project. Representative Erdahl. Did you hear about West Drive before? I'm sure I must have, but I don't remember. <laughs> Does Ma the Department of... Just, uh, Madam Chair, perhaps Representative Detmer, Madam you Chair. tell me about West Freeway Drive. If you take a... Uh, I think most of you have gone Excuse to Duluth, me. Madam Chair, Representative and perhaps Detmer. an Erdahl. Uh, if most of you have gone to Duluth, you know the, that big project that's been going on in, in the Forest Lake area. Where, where it's the re, resurfacing of the freeway there, the split bridge, the bridge going to Highway 8, and then that Highway 97 bridge. And what we're looking at, I carried the bill in 2017. It's not in my district, but most of the traffic comes from Washington County. And that, those different, the part that we're, we want to finish if you talk to the public safety people in both the Columbus, Anoka County, and Washington County, and Forest Lake, that's a big part of this project. And we didn't think that uh, the $9 million would have done that, but now that there's, a, there's money left over, we want to use it to finish the project. So it's done. I know the school district, a lot of buses come across the freeway there. That, that type of, that stretch of road is important, that it can serve the Columbus, the city of Columbus, to get things done the right way. But Representative Detmer, yesterday when I came through Columbus on my way back here from the Caucasus, I saw this big empty eagle's nest in a tree. But beside that big empty eagle's nest, what I assumed to be an empty one, but Representative Lilly tells me that should be eggs in there at this time of the year. 
there were two eagles just kind of hanging out by the nest. And I don't know if they were courting or what they were doing, but they didn't seem to be doing very much, but they sure were elegant sitting up there in that tree by the eagle's nest. And so everything must be happy in that area well, Madam Chair, now that the road construction is all done. Madam Chair, I saw those same eagles. I, I remember one eagle said to the other eagle, when are they going to finish this project? Oh, do you think that's what they were talking I think, about? I, th I think so. <laughs> They it didn't look like very much was coming out of their mouth at the time. They kind of looked kind of drowsy, even. <laughs> I'll have to think about that. But is the Department of Corrections um, or not the Department of Transportation, are they in on this uh, 1.2 million to 1.4 million West Drive so, um, Madam, Madam Chair. appropriation? Madam Chair, yes, they, they're, um, they're supportive of this. It, we're not asking for any additional money through the bill. Right. It's just it's using just their remaining the balance. It's leftover money you want to keep rather than return it and let some other little community and two <laughs> other birds. Um, I would like to see something in writing from Department of Transportation that supports this river, West River, West Drive. Was drive it. And that will complete it then, huh? I'm just check, Madam Chair, uh, just checking to see if there's oh, somebody I here think, from MnDOT. I think someone's going to come and. There we go. We're going to hear about it. Mayor, will you let her sit there, please? Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Morning, Witt. committee members. My name is Jennifer Witt. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And as Mr. McPherson said, we are supportive. We're, we're fine with this. And you think that's the best use of that $1.2 to $1.4 million left It is over. important to Anoka County, so, um, you know, we're okay. And the district engineer thinks that's okay, too? Actually, yes. The district engineer, Representative Murphy, is, is fine with it. So, yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We will hold this bill over for possible inclusion. Representative Pearson, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to have to account for that. Okay. House file 2939. Representative Tapke, Scott County. Welcome to the committee. We will consider this bill that's before us and hear it and hold it over for possible inclusion. Representative Tapke. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Representative Tackby from uh, Shakopee. Today we have three different bills um, into the Capital Investment Committee that uh, we're seeing this summer. They've all three gone through the MMB process and we're really proud to bring them forward as three projects that uh, the county and the city have been working on for a really long time uh, that we'd like uh, state bonding assistance in getting them completed. And the first of the, the three projects we're going to talk about today is a uh, major connection from Carver County to from the land of Greg Bow, Representative Greg Bow, to uh, Scott County. And so it's uh, in an amazing area along the Minnesota River called the uh, Louisville Swamp. And uh, it is uh, the entire Minnesota River in the southern metro has incredible park area, incredible natural areas, and this would add access between Carver County and Scott County and make major regional trail connections. So this is a 2.12 miles of paved trail. It has four bridges. It would cross uh, the Minnesota River in an uh, area where a former rail bed was, and so we are really excited. I have uh, today with me a uh, Scott County Commissioner to uh, discuss the regional and statewide impact of the project and why this is important. Madam Chair. Commissioner. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Barb Weckman Brecky. I'm a Scott County Commissioner. Uh, excited to be here today to talk about the Merriam Junction Trail. I grew up in this area, and Madam Chair, I can let you know there are a lot of eagles and eagles' nests in this area. Um, and I think those eagles would like to see some. Uh, development down there. Uh, this trail is truly a regional regional trail. If I were sitting in your chair today, I'd be wondering why why are we being asked to uh, support this 2.12 mile trail? That sounds pretty local. <coughs> it's not. This is a major connection between Scott and Kyber counties and into the whole region. Uh, you're familiar with our area. You know we have that wonderful natural resource, the Minnesota River there, but that wonderful natural resource makes traveling and crossing very difficult. So that's why we're here. Both Scott and Carver County have already made significant investments on either side of the river. And this trail, this 2.12 miles, really would open up a, a bounty of public lands to better and more accessible use by, by citizens. We have the states, Minnesota Valley, trail there, the Minnesota Valley Recreation Center, and several units of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, land of, of Louisville Swamp and, and the Rapids Lake unit. I think number two is you look at the price tag here, we're asking for $9 million with a county match of a little over $5 million. It's because of those bridges. You all know bridges are expensive. We have one uh, large rail bridge that collapsed back in Gosh, 2007, I remember that. I live very near to this area. And then three other bridges that need retrofitting. So this is the kind of project that's hard to do um, with local, just the local dollars. And then finally, we're ready to roll. I think that's the number, number three thing that I really want to highlight. Um, Scott County has already invested in, in the trail over 169 as part of our recent project there. We have all of the right of way secured preliminary engineering plans are done. So I think those those are the three things I'd like to highlight. You do have a map here showing how this uh, portion of the trail connects with the regional system in Scott and Carver and even Hennepin counties. And on the other side of the map shows the specifics of that 2.12 miles. Any questions? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Tabke. Often when we do trails, uh, sometime in the process, the question comes up whether they should be paved or not paved, particularly it seems when we're in the Minnesota River Valley. And just wondering uh, what those converse, if those conversations have been held, um, if, we're, if we do this, are we going to get uh, some drama at some point about whether they should be paved or not paved? Representative Tapke. Madam Chair and Representative Hansen, uh, I don't believe there will be any drama come up with this. We have a significant portion of paved trail uh, through Shakopee that this will, uh, this doesn't connect directly into the paved trail, but we have a significant portion along the uh, Highway 101 and along the Minnesota River that goes uh, from Shakopee and across the Bloomington Ferry Bridge into Bloomington and then up into uh, the Fort Snelling area, and this goes all the way down to St. Peter and Mankato going the other direction. So this makes a, a major trail connection and connects uh, as well. The, um, the Scott County has already finished, if you look on this side of the map, there's already a section that has been finished that was already done during a current road project that Scott County is uh, in the middle of currently. And so this would connect a uh, paved section here to the paved, uh, excuse me, to the paved sections that are in downtown Carver. And Madam Chair, as well, we also have an amendment that I need to uh, get Still. for the bill. Amendment 39A1. Move the amendment. Representative Constantine moves the adoption of the amendment. And what does it do, Representative Papke? Uh Madam Chair, the amendment uh, fixes a uh, drafting error that we had uh, for the county match for for the matching for this project. Uh, it has the the draft has 36 million as the match, and it should only be uh, 5.838 million. And so that fixes a technical error there, which is a pretty big technical error. Pretty big. <laughs> yeah. So you want that? To be five million eight hundred and thirty eight thousand. Yes. Okay. Any other amendments? Not for me. Okay. All in favor of adoption of the amendments signify by saying aye. 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 
proposed amendment is adopted. <coughs> Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a point of clarification, you said you already have approximately $5 million committed from the cities. Madam Chair, oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner. Madam Chair and committee members, yes, uh, from the county. The county match would be that $5.8.38 million. Thank you. Any other discussion? If not, we will go on. Thank you very much, Thank Madam. Thank you very much. Thank you. The amendment or the bill as bills as amended will be held over for bill <laughs> for possible inclusion. House file 2940, Representative Kapke. Thank you, Madam Chair. The second uh, project that we have to bring before you today is uh, from the city of Shakopee. Uh, the city of Shakopee, to our recollection, has never uh, received or requested any bonding money in the past. And this project is very much um, an environmental project and an infrastructure project that we are uh, working on throughout downtown Shakopee. And uh, the Minnesota River is moving uh, as rivers have a tendency to do. The Minnesota River is uh, moving and it has, uh, with the Recent over the last decade, we've had a significant increase in the number of flooding events in the Minnesota River uh, through downtown Shakopee, and that has uh, created major issues uh, with our infrastructure. And so the uh, um, the river bank uh, has encroached upon the downtown area, and we need to work on the stabilization of the river bank. And at the same time, we are working on uh, with many partners on building a. Uh, coalition to create a cultural corridor. So this has a significant history uh, in Minnesota history with the Shakopee, Midwakan, and Sioux community and uh, the Dakota community. And so we have a letter of support in the packet from the Shakopee, Midwakan, and Sioux community um, for, uh, for this project in creating a cultural corridor that reflects the history of the area because it has significant history. And uh, Madam Chair, I have uh, uh, Mr. Michael Kursky from the city of Shakopee here to discuss uh, quickly the infrastructure impacts that the moving, that the river has moved over 50 feet over the course of the last uh, 100 years and uh, encroaching upon our historic downtown. Director Kersey. Madam Chair and Representatives, so the river's um, inundating the area on a regular basis now. It used to be every few years, now it's every year. And our main sewer line that we inherited from the Met Council runs through this area. We project that we'll lose another 50 feet on each side of the riverbank um, by 2060. That will impact all of that infrastructure. Um, it's bad enough right now. The state trail that runs through this area actually collapsed into the river and we had to move it. So the river is encroaching quickly. That's 100,000 cubic yards of dirt that's going downriver into the Savage area. That's 6,000 truckloads to put it in perspective. So it's a, a lot of dirt. The plan is to stabilize that riverbank and then as Representative Tapke said, work with our partners in actually uh, relocating part of that state trail and then working to preserve a lot of the cultural um, antiquities that are in that area that right now are going into the river. So you're asking for what appropriation? Yeah. Madam Chair, the uh, request uh, specifically is for 11,753,000 for uh, riverbank stabilization and uh, the creation of the cultural corridor in uh, that is working in conjunction. Uh, the, the local matches on these are between uh, working with uh, the city, the county, as well as the Shakopee Middle Rock and Sioux community, Three Rivers Park District, and uh, a variety of other local uh, partners in getting this done. How much of the trail would be relocated? Uh, Madam Chair and Representative, so um, the section that runs through Huber Park and then along some of the Shakopee, Minnetowoc, and Sioux area would have to be relocated because right now it's underwater for a good part of the year. And so that does not allow either bike or pedestrian access through that area mm -hmm. so that we locate it up to higher ground. 
Mr. Kursky, is that feet or is that miles? Uh, Chair and representatives, it would be uh, miles. Like how many? Um, there's approximately three miles of trail between Huber Park and the landing, so probably about 20 to 30 percent of that would have to come out of the current floodplain. So, so one mile? Probably, yes, Madam Chair, about a mile. And Madam Chair and Representatives, the last piece, um, all of this property along the river is either owned um, and controlled by either DNR, the city, or the Shakopee Minnetowoc and Sioux. The city did acquire outside of this project the last 14 acres on the riverfront um, at the end of last year that were privately held. So now it's all controlled by public entities or the tribe. Thank you. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Tab, can you, do you know uh, have there been in, in, cons in consultation with DNR about this at all, or is there any uh, flood mitigation dollars that can be used? I will let Mr. Kursky answer that, if that's Mr. all right. Mr. Kursky. Uh, we have not had the flood mitigation discussion with the DNR, but um, for years this area has been in it. They have participated using some federal money. We lost the pedestrian bridge that's um, between the uh, Memorial Park and the DNR Trail, and we've been working for, I think, six or seven years to get that replaced and participating with the DNR, the Shakopee Minnetowoc and Sioux community, the county and the city have raised funds to replace that bridge, but it's been a, a long and somewhat painful process. So we would like to really get this bank stabilized. Um, for those of you that took the tour, it's a no longer a bank, it's more of a cliff, and it's only gonna get worse um, as we have these constant flooding events. Representative Dean. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't know if this is for uh, Representative Tapke or you, Mr. Persky. Um, so, so you're gonna be doing some stuff to the river at this point and uh, trying to sort of, what I say, circumvent what is a natural process because that's what happens. And I'm curious in the, the design of the project, has there been much extensive study on the impact sort of uh, downriver uh, as far as what, what it's gonna do to water flows or other types of things? Are there other areas of erosion that may be, you know, increased or exacerbated as a result of this? I'm just curious to what extent this study has gone. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't something that was looked in isolation, but I'm curious about some of the, uh, the extent of the initial study. Madam Chair and Representatives, um, the, the goal is not to make matters worse downstream. I think one of the issues is over the past 100 years, the river has eroded over 100 feet. And as I said, it used to be um, back in the 1850s, it was a pretty natural, gentle, gentle slope down to the river. And as I said, now it's more of a cliff. Um, our consultants have projected putting that gentle slope back and removing a lot of the invasive species and large trees that have grown up that have created um, a lot of the flooding events and actually allowing the water to come up into the area much more naturally um, and creating kind of a natural floodplain that doesn't exist today so it would not be eroding the bank. So it would actually allow kind of a larger area to flood. And they've built into the design some areas that um, would be able to kind of more purify and, and when the water came up into them, it wouldn't have as much damage as we're experiencing today. So I think we will resolve those engineering problems and design problems and make it, I think, a much better situation than we have today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. We'll hold this over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much. House file 2941. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. This is uh, the final project we're here to discuss today, so thank you very much for uh, allowing us to put these together here. And um, you've got a minute. I will make it very quickly. So you see a theme with our projects of uh, uh, access to the Minnesota River and making sure that we are uh, recognizing that history. And so this project, when 169 was built through Shakopee in the 90s, it was not built with pedestrian connections throughout the community. And so we have a three and a half plus mile section of, uh, of highway that is not accessible from uh, the south side of town across the highway to the industrial park as well as to the river uh, area. And so we are asking for a project that was both uh, included in the governor's bonding bill 
um, to create a pedestrian bridge over 169 to bridge that gap of three and a quarter miles. And I have uh, Risa Husted, who is here today, and she is an avid biker, and she works uh, in the biking industry, and she uses this area all the time and wants to talk about the regional impact, if you will, Madam Chair, of this pedestrian bridge. Ms. Husted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I. Um, I commute by bike year round and I just want to emphasize how important this kind of connection will be for the area. Not only is it going to be the only way to get across 169 for several miles if you are on a bike, but it also represents the only pedestrian crossing of 169 east of, um, east of the city center. Um, I, I think that it's a no brainer to connect uh, the future regional tr destination um, th that's being built north of 169 to the uh, residential areas south of 169, but it will also help connect the, the DNR trails and the crossing um, on, uh, over the Minnesota River um, to the city of Shakopee and everything south. Thank you very much. <coughs> Representative, we will hold this over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members. That concludes Representative Tabke's agenda. <laughs> Representative Cantrell. Ms. Breeze. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, House File 3138 um, would uh, appropriate uh, $5.269 uh, million uh, from bond proceeds um, uh, in the state transportation fund to fund critical road improvements in, uh, in highway or on uh, Highway 13 and Savage. Um, there are really two major highways uh, in that area, and that is Highway 42 and Highway 13. Both are at or over capacity. Um, I will say if you if you were to type in Highway 13 and Savage accidents in your in the search bar on Google and, and click on the news tab, you would see accidents every couple of months. It's really independent of season, and that's because this road has such high congestion. It's it's uh, I think the the most uh, traveled uh, artery in the state, um, but we have several major uh, highways and freeways that flow into Highway 13. And it is also a major, um, a major corridor through which uh, the the businesses in our community um, conduct commerce. So uh, I'm going to turn my presentation over to uh, uh, Lisa uh, Fries, uh, and uh, I, I ask uh, please for your support for these really important road improvements. Thank you, Ms. Fries. Chair Murphy, members of the committee, uh, I'm Lisa Fries. I'm the Transportation Services Director at Scott County. And uh, this project is something that we've been working on for quite some time. Um, Trunk Highway 13 itself is a major connection between I-35W and 169. And it's really the main east-west corridor in the northern part of the county uh, to provide access. So it's an important commuter route. But most importantly, it serves statewide as a frail, as a is a freight area because of the Ports of Savage. Mm -hmm. The Ports of Savage is a major, major uh, facility that takes in over 3.3 ton, million tons of uh, agricultural commodities each year from uh, pretty much all parts of southern Minnesota. So it's very critical for our agricultural industry. It also is a key area uh, for pricing of agricultural commodities because both the rail lines and the river ports come together here, so it's a multimodal area for um, commodity transportation. So it's important for pricing. Uh, over the years, and I've worked on this corridor for 20 plus years now, uh, congestion has picked up because of uh, the rapid growth uh, in Dakota and Scott County. And it's becoming increasingly more difficult for the um, truckers who come in, and a lot of those folks are farmers, uh, who come in and use the ports uh, each year. It's not uncommon to see uh, 10, 12 trucks at this particular intersection backed up waiting to make a left-hand turn. I've even witnessed myself uh, truckers waiting and then doing 
turning it into a dual left turn mm -hmm. and uh, two trucks going at once across the roadway. So there's some very um, scary situations going on. So our project that we're proposing to do, and we have some funding aligned, but we have a gap yet, is an interchange at Dakota Avenue. And that interchange will serve some major ter terminals there. It'll serve one of the Cargill terminals, terminals uh, Superior Minerals, Cenex Harvest States, uh, Riverland, and a number of other key businesses like Fabcon Industries. And if you're familiar with Fabcon, they're the supplier of pretty much all of the major commercial industrial building tip-up panels uh, throughout the region. So there's some really important businesses here that need to get freight in and out. So what we're asking for is that we have a gap in the project. It's about a $35 million project, and we have about a $5.3 million gap. And we're asking for that for the city of Savage because there's a lot of local road improvements that need to go into this really truly regional and statewide project. And uh, um, they will have a tough time coming up with that um, amount of cash to match in the project. Uh, we also have some Scott County transportation sales tax money on this project. Um, and we've uh, worked hard with the city to secure both some state and federal freight money and regional money through the Met Council. So uh, we appreciate your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have it. Seeing none, this bill will be held over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you committee members. <laughs> this meeting is adjourned.